Well, I am enjoying being back with you. It's been a long time since we've been able to come together and slowly we're making our way back together. And it, let me tell you, it's an joy to be here this morning with you. I enjoy this as one of the great pleasures that I have is to, is to preach. I enjoy doing it. I've always wanted to do it. And, and every chance I get, I take advantage of that all through the many years that I've done this. This has been a joy and a pleasure. One of the pleasures we have as children of God is the ability not only to come together and worship God, but we have the ability and the special privilege to offer sacrifices to God. The only sacrifices that He will accept are those from His children, from his, to the saints. As we are all members of the Lord's body, we are the ones, we are called the royal priesthood. We are the ones who offer those sacrifices, sacrifices of song, the sacrifices of praise, the sacrifices of prayer, and of course, partaking of the Lord's Supper. That is a privilege and a blessing and something that we do. Now tomorrow on Monday is going to be what is known as Memorial Day. I've entitled this morning's lesson, Why on Sunday? Why do we partake of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week? Why do we do that? That is in a memorial, and we're going to see that mentioned here in the Scriptures in just a moment. Why do we do it on Sunday? Turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah 53 and verse 5. Isaiah chapter 53, and we'll start at verse 5. Well, now let's back up a little bit. <clears throat> let's start at verse 3. This is talking about our Lord. And it's going to be talking about the things that we are to remember when we partake of the Lord's Supper. Starting with verse 3 in Isaiah 53. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And he hid as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep and before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people, and he is stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. That's talking about our Lord about his crucifixion and the things that happened to him for us. What a great and wonderful prophecy Isaiah had and how, how well it came true. We are to have a memorial. Memorials are for the purpose of preserving precious moments and memories of an important event or person. They are to encourage and ensure that people or events are not forgotten and those involved receive proper recognition. Consider the tomb of the unknown soldier. That's there for the purpose to remember those who died, who were lost, that we don't know their names because of the circumstances of their loss. But we want to remember their efforts, their sacrifice. What about the Vietnam Memorial? There are all kinds of memorials erected. There are some that are erected along the highway for someone whom we don't know, but that cross 
or that marker is there because someone wants to remember that person. What about the 4th of July celebration? That's intended as a memorial to remember the 4th of July, a day of independence. All memorials have a specified place and time that they are set to occur. Else they wouldn't be a memorial for all to follow, would it? They have a specified time and place. As an example, as mentioned before, what a memorial day. That's going to be tomorrow. It's yearly is a yearly recognition of fallen soldiers that is observed on the last Monday in May. Whatever date that might be, it's the last Monday in May always that it's set aside. So it has a specified time and the place is everywhere. For the Christian, God has set a weekly memorial. He has specified when the memorial is to take place and he has set aside a time to be observed on the first day of the week. This memorial is called the Lord's Supper. Turn with me to Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Acts 20 verse 7 says, And upon the first day of the week, how much more clear can God make it? On the first day of the week, when the disciples came together, who are disciples? Those are people who follow the Lord. To break bread. That is not to eat lunch together. That is to observe the Lord's Supper. The exact same Greek Terminology used when the Lord Himself initiated the Lord's Supper. Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. This is not a suggestion by God. He told His disciples when they were to go out and to teach, and later as the apostles they did, they were to go out and what? Teach all the things that He had taught them to do. They had His authority behind them, the Holy Spirit helped them to remember all the things that the Lord had taught them. And they were to ingrain them, indoctrinate them, and teach them. And it's what that word means, doctrinos. Teach them to those who were to become Christians. And that's why it says they observed the Lord's Supper. They remained steadfast in the apostles' doctrine, we're told in Scripture. Following what the apostles had taught them to do. And coming together on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, and partaking of the Lord's Supper is part of that teaching. We know it is because Paul reminded them in Corinthians. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. And he's talking about the Lord's Supper. Listen to what he's telling them. This is a memorial. This is the purpose of this partaking of the Lord's Supper. It's not a suggestion made by God, but rather a command of God designed for the purpose to help Christians to remember Christ's death until He returns. 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and following. And when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Paul is the one teaching here. Was Paul there when he did that? No. But the Lord taught him on the road to Damascus. He tells, tells us very clearly that the Lord Himself taught him. Though He taught Paul this, He also taught the other apostles. And he taught them to remember that. And why would he be reminding them of this? It's because he knows the purpose of the Lord's Supper. And it is to be done on the first day of the week. Listen to what he's saying. After the same manner he took the cup. And when he had stopped saying this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. How often were they to drink it? On the Lord's day, the first day of the week which Acts 20 and verse 7 clearly specifies. Look at verse 25. After the same manner also he took the cup. I'm sorry, verse 26. I'm reading the wrong one. Verse 26. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do what? Show or remember or have a memorial, that word means. The Lord's death until he come. So how long are we to do this? Until he comes. How long are we to remain faithful? Until the Lord returns all of our life, whichever comes first. It's not hard to understand that. We're not, we are being told what the purpose of the Lord's Supper is. It is immemorial. Now the world is wanting to stand still tomorrow and remember all those who made sacrifices of their lives in war and times of trial for our freedoms, for the lives that we have. Beloved, we need to be remembering Christ every day in our lives. Putting Him first in our life. But on the Lord's Day, on Sunday, we all need to remember that the Lord died for us and why. We are to partake in remembrance of Christ. So we understand that we're to partake of this and we're to do it once a week on Lord's Day. What exactly are we to remember then? Just that He died or is there more to it than that? Beloved, there's a whole lot more to it than that. Turn with me in your Bibles as we look at things we need to remember. In Luke chapter 22, 20, 39 through 46. We're not going to read all of those scriptures, but that's the subject that we're talking about at this moment. Jesus suffered. Remember, we need to remember how He suffered. His suffering began long before He was put on trial and arrested. His suffering began for him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus' suffering began before he was arrested and ultimately crucified. He knew, he knew of the impending circumstances that were coming his way. And he would be placed under those circumstances and he couldn't avoid it. But he did what? He prayed. And it says he prayed in agony. Verse 44 of that scripture selection I gave you. Luke twenty-two forty-four 44 it says, And he being in agony prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. This is mental anguish. In anticipation of what was to come. He knew what he was going to suffer. He knew from before the foundation of the world what he was going to do. But when the moment finally came, when he knew that it was about time for it to take place, he still had feelings. He still had agony. Realizing what he was going to have to suffer. We need to remember, as we partake of that Lord's Supper, how much the Lord loves you. He loves you so much, He suffered long before the crucifixion. He suffered in thoughts and anticipation, realizing the anguish that He would be suffering. And He did it for you. What did He say in His prayer? Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. It was God's will that He be the sacrifice in our place. We need to be remembering that. Beloved, if we remember that, if we understand that Christ died for our salvation, He died for our remission of sins, He died that we could have eternal life. Beloved, in realizing this, how much better a Christian would we be if we allowed ourselves to understand the sacrifice that was made on our behalf, our love and our dedication to Him would be multiplied. What is the natural response for someone who does something good for you? is to want to do something good in return. Beloved, God's told you, if you love me, keep my commandments. If we want to do good, we want to show Him how much we appreciate what He's done. We're going to do what He asks us to do. We're going to be Christians. We're going to be children of God. We're going to serve Him. It begins with a memory. A realization of what He has done on our behalf. We need to remember how he was scourged. We need to have that mental image. 
of what took place for our Lord. In Matthew 27, verse 26 is where you'll find that. A scourging is a terrible punishment. One he didn't deserve, not at all. It was a mock trial. They lied to put him into, into custody. They lied before uh, the pilot. They did all kinds of deception to get him to this point. He didn't deserve to be there. You've got to understand what a scourging is. They would take the prisoner and they had a big upright post or stone slab, whatever the situation called for, wherever it was. And they would anchor him to that post or that slab of, or rock where he couldn't move. And they would take, sometimes they were called cats of nine tails. It was a leather whip, a short one. It wasn't very long. But at the end of each length of leather was tied a shard of bone or a piece of glass or broken pottery, whatever was sharp. And they knew that if they exceeded 40 stripes that the likelihood of death would occur from loss of blood alone. So that's where you get your saying of 30, uh, 40 stripes save one, so 39 stripes. They would take it to the extreme as far as they could go. The whole purpose of this instrument of torture was to rip the flesh off the back. No vital organs, but massive amounts of pain and blood loss. And they just didn't hit your back. It went from the base of your neck all the way down to the back of your legs. They did that to our Lord. And the scriptures say that he took our place. That's where we're supposed to be. How would you feel if you were standing next to someone and they voluntarily took your place at that post so you wouldn't have to suffer that and you realize what they've done? How would you feel towards that person? You would want to do whatever you could do to make it, make it good for them, right? That's what the Lord did for you. How can you turn your back on someone who loves you that much? Matthew 27, verse 26 says, Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, who that, this Pilate turned him over to be scourged, he delivered him to be crucified. So that was a standard punishment before you were crucified. This was reserved for the worst offenses. He hadn't done anything. So they took him and beat him. And the massive amounts of blood loss ripped flesh from his back. We need to remember that. We need to remember that after that happened, he was shamed publicly, humiliated publicly. The soldiers mocked him and stripped him. Then they placed a crown of thorns upon his head and placed a scarlet robe upon his scourged body and then spit upon him. While they did this, they struck him with a reed they had given him. Look at Matthew 27, verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall. That was a big open area where anybody could gather they wanted to gather. Common means open to the public. You don't think people were there watching this? Think about those that had turned him over. Especially those high level Jewish men that had put on a mock trial. Oh, they didn't like him. They wanted him out of the way. Don't you think they were there watching? You bet they were. And gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. So all the soldiers were, that were there were involved. And they stripped him, publicly humiliating him. These were Roman soldiers, so it's not like you see in the movies. They didn't leave him any shred of dignity. They stripped him. 
and put him on a, put a scarlet robe. This is after he'd been scourged. Hanging that heavy robe on the open wounds. And when they had plated the crown of thorns, they put it on his head and the reed in his right hand, and they bowed to the knee and mocked him. Oh, they were, oh, they were mean. Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him in the head. As if what they'd already done wasn't enough. Let's do more. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him. Can you imagine how that felt? They weren't being delicate. They weren't being considerate. How many times had he probably fallen down already after they were beating him? They yanked him around, even held him up while they were hitting him, hitting him in the head. And they led him away to crucify him. We need to remember how humble Jesus was during all of this. What did we read in Isaiah 53 and verse 7 a while ago? He was oppressed. Wouldn't you call that an oppression? Humiliating him, beating him, mistreating him as they did. Yet he opened not his mouth. He didn't say anything. He is brought in as a lamb to be slaughtered. Why did they choose lamb? Lamb was one of the main animals for sacrifice. Lambs are very timid. They're not aggressive. They don't retaliate. And as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He didn't say anything. So we need to remember how humble he was in all of this. And remember the things that he said afterwards. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23, 24. After all of that, we have a song we call that's entitled, He Could Have Called 10,000 Angels. Remember what he said before Pilate when he said, uh, are you a king? He said, my kingdom is not of this world. Why? Because it's a spiritual kingdom. He was not deceiving him. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were so, would not my subject deliver me? He could have called angels. Remember how the devil tempted him on the Temple Mount, you know, talking about dashing your foot against the stone, that they would lift you up, and the angels would take care of you because of who you are. He didn't do that. He was humble. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What about, Verily I say unto you, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Even while he was hanging on the cross, he had compassion on the thief that was hanging there who chose to defend him and acknowledge who he was. Even in agony, the Lord had compassion. That's in Luke 23, 43. What about when he looked upon Mary and he said, Woman, behold thy son. He looked over and said, Behold thy mother. He was considering her and her needs while he was hanging in agony. John 19, 26 through 27. What about as he hung there, he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Matthew 27, verse 46, and Mark 25, 34. He knew God was with him. He knew when the presence of the Lord was lifted from him. When he was just a man. In John 19, 28, as the man hung in agony, the man, Jesus, he says, I thirst. He was suffering. We need to envision that. We need to understand it. I thirst. 
Finally, he realized the time had come. In John 19, verse 30, he says, It is finished. What is finished? His purpose in being here? His being here to live as a man, to suffer as we suffer, to be tempted as we are suffered, to be the perfect Lamb of God, to be offered as sacrifice for you, for me, for every soul that shall ever have lived. It's finished. It's done. God's perfect plan is finished. What about Luke 23, verse 46? Where he says, Father, into my hands I commend my spirit into your hands. He knew who was in control. He knew the Lord would live, raise him again. He had faith. He had confidence. Even in the face of all that he suffered. We need to have that kind of faith, don't we? Oh, what a wonderful example he is from the beginning of his life through the end. We need to think of these things. Look at all those things we need to be remembering every time we partake of the Lord's Supper. Finally, we need to remember His sacrifice. His sacrifice provides so much. It provides reconciliation. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. Turn with me there. It provides reconciliation. It brings us back into a right relationship with God. Second Corinthians 5, verse 18. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ. Through Christ and His sacrifice, He's brought us back into a right relationship. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. He's given to us the ministry, the teaching of the gospel to all. That they can be redeemed. They have been if they accept Christ and follow the commandments that God has given us. Follow the gospel. Look at verse 19. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God that did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. Christ provides that reconciliation. An avenue through which we can be brought back into a right relationship with God. Isn't that a wonderful Savior? Isn't that a wonderful realization of what God has done for us? For us and not for any other purpose. His sacrifice provides redemption. He paid the penalty. He paid the price we are supposed to pay. Which one of us here today would want to be in Christ's place? Who would want to go through what He suffered? If you had a choice, see Christ did it regardless because he loves you. And he did it for our redemption. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. According to the riches of His grace. Where is grace? In Christ Jesus. Through Christ's sacrifice, we have forgiveness of sins. We have redemption. He paid the penalty. A price we could not pay. A debt I, debt I owed. And Christ did it for me. Because He loved me. Just as He loves you. Our forgiveness of sins is in Christ Jesus. It's in His grace. And the only way we can have that is when we're baptized into Christ. Romans chapter 6 explains that. Therein is where the blood is applied. The blood washes away the sins. He provided for that. That's obedience to the gospel. That's doing what the Lord has said. 
His sacrifice provides remission. That is removal. In Matthew 26, verse 28, it says, For this is what my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. He clearly tells you what his blood was shed for. That's why he died on the cross. That's why he chose to follow through and do what God had asked him to do. For remission of sins. In his blood. These are things we're supposed to be remembering. Oh, we get into such a habit because we partake of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. We can be distracted by our cell phones. We can be distracted by something in the pew. We can be distracted by something outside that we saw on the way here or something we have to do after the church. There's all kinds of things the devil can throw into your mind. But beloved, our mind is supposed to be on Christ and all that He did for us. That's why it's a memorial. Remember these things. Think on these things. Our Lord was and is truly the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John, John chapter 1, verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God. I need to remember that. I need to think on these things. His sacrifice was once and for all, meaning it was only done one time and will never have to be done again. In Hebrews, we're told it's an eternal sacrifice. His, his blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat once and for all, never having to be done again because it was the perfect sacrifice. And it is an eternal one just as His Word is eternal. His promise of forgiveness of sins is a promise that is eternal. It is part of His eternal covenant. Think of these things. That's what Christ's death means to you or should mean to you. And beloved, realizing these things, understanding these things, just like Peter says, what, ought, what kind of Christian ought I to be in all holiness? I love the Lord, and I'm sure you do too. I love Him for what He's done for me. But beloved, how do I demonstrate that love? How do I demonstrate my gratefulness to Him for what He's done for me? I do it the way He says, John 14, 15. I keep His commandments. We can read about this in Hebrews 9, verse 28. In chapter 10, verse 12, I believe it is. We need to remember what Christ has done. That is our memorial every first day of the week. You see how important that is? Now why do I need to remember it every first day of the week? Beloved, how many times during the day do we have to be reminded of something that we're supposed to do in just one day? How many times have we gotten up and remembered, oh, I need to do so and so this morning, and we get distracted by something, and we go about our daily life and take care of things, and we realize, oh, I forgot. I forgot what I was supposed to do this morning. Beloved, if I need to be reminded more often during the one single day of something I need to do, how much more important is that I need to be reminded of what Christ did for me? This world is full of distractions, beloved, and there's no harm in reminding myself and being reminded how much the Lord loves me. There are some in the world who try to say, well, you, you do that so often that it doesn't have the same meaning, beloved, if you're a true Christian, if you truly love God. It does have meaning and it will always have meaning because it is an eternal sacrifice. He's my eternal Savior. God is my eternal Father and everything that He says means something to me. It is not trivial and should never be thought of in that way. If you're here this morning and the Lord's sacrifice means something to you, the way you can take advantage of what He's done for you is to obey the Gospel. You hear, you believe, you confess, you repent, and you are baptized for the remission of your sins, as the Scriptures so say. It. If you need to be baptized today, now is your opportunity to do that. If you are a child of God and you have fallen by the wayside, you've stumbled, you've fallen, you've forgotten 
what the Lord's sacrifice truly means to you. Now's your opportunity to make your life right with the Lord. Whatever the case, whatever we can do for you and the Lord, we're here for you. We love you. The Lord certainly does. Won't you come as together we stand and invite you in song.